Now? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I can hear that. Um, <laughs> thank you to each of our speakers for three very interesting papers, uh, particularly fascinating to, to think about the informal um, networks, the conversations, um, the, the relationships that are happening below the surface of those or behind the production of, of these formal documents that we can study. Um, and also some very exciting projects to look forward to. All very busy. Um, so uh, we now have about 30 minutes for questions. So if you're in the room, please raise your hand. If you are joining us online, please use the chat function. Any questions? Um, thank you to all the speakers for uh, some really interesting papers. Um, my question is for Sam, because I sort of vaguely work on your period. So um, you mentioned a little bit about um, bishops working as chancellors, um, so in the chancery, and I believe some of them also worked in the exchequer at various points as well. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about how they squared this sort of worldliness, I suppose, with, with uh, working in the church itself. Uh I can, although I don't want to talk for the entire half hour question period uh, on that point. Uh, there were undeniably tensions uh, that bishops felt uh, between their royal offices uh, and uh, their ecclesiastical responsibilities. Um, and some of them sort of uh, observed these more than others. Uh, it, there, there had been a a long series dating back to biblical times, no man can serve two masters, uh, for he'll neglect the one, etc. Uh, this was the work of, in the previous century, of thinkers like Robert Grosstest uh, had dwelt on this. It's also in, in canon law. So John Grandison, who I mentioned, the Bishop of Exeter, uh, in his copy of, of, of the canon of, uh, the apostolic canons, uh, uh, I'll try to say them in the public translation. Um, he, um, yeah, he specifically marked uh, the copy which uh, people shouldn't take uh, public office, they may neglect the cure of souls. Um, but that said, uh, there was another school of argument, which is that many uh, Old Testament figures, uh, Samuel, Eli, and so on, had uh, balanced these and had sort of both uh, spiritual and temporal offices. Uh, there was a line of argument which said that you're able to um, counselling the king it is, is, what, is what clergy should do and the importance of, of the king having proper counsel. And yeah, so there were, there were lines on both sides. Uh, this, I think that one of the times the tension between these views was most explicit was with John Stratford uh, in 1341, uh, where he said, uh, well, in, actually in December 1340, uh, to his uh, congregation at Canterbury, he spoke with tears in his eyes uh, and said that he'd neglected the cure of souls because he'd been so bound up in worldly affairs. But he then said in the self-same speech that uh, I'm going to fight for the rights of the church in Parliament, and the reason why the church is so abused is because the king isn't having counsel from clergymen like me, but from uh, people and unwise laymen who aren't equipped to, to fight him for counsel. So this sort of, the church is being oppressed because he's not listening to churchmen, but also... I've been giving him too much time and therefore the church is oppressed because I'm not doing enough. Uh, so I think, uh, to cut a long story short, I think you can, can, there were valid arguments for, for both and ultimately you can't involve yourself in government to the extent that your pastoral responsibilities are completely overlooked, uh, but also bishops had responsibilities to do at least some involvement in government. They swore uh, when their uh, temporalities were restored to them that they would be attendant to the king's council. Uh, and quite how you balanced those, I think, was up to uh, the individual clergyman to justify to himself, to his flocks and to God. Any, any other questions?
Thank you. Um, Sam, I'm sorry to give you yet another question, but actually I did have a point which um, slightly follows on from that question. Um, I, I just wondered, um, and, and forgive me if this is a slightly ignorant question because I'm not um, uh, an expert in this period by any means, but I, I, I just wondered if you could um, sort of set the, the clergy in this era into a kind of wider European context. Um, and I just wondered whether, um, you know, for churchmen, their, their role as members of, you know, a, a pan-European Catholic church creates uh, a tension um, with their role um, in, in English politics, as it were. Uh I think the tension comes less over sort of necessarily being pan-European per se, and more with the, the consequence of that, that they are nominally under papal authority. Um, because throughout Europe, uh, in, in many countries, churchmen being ultimately uh, one of the relatively small portions of the population that are literate, uh, they, are, they are used in writing offices uh, quite widely. However, they're, and thus they do have many of these roles um, in France and in other areas. But um, yes, being uh, under, there, there are tensions, or, and, or can be at least, uh, between royal and papal authority. Uh, the, the bus stop isn't quite as bad as we see in the 1530s, uh, but uh, we do see it, uh, it in, in periods in, in Edward III's reign, so in the, in the good parliament of 1376, there's a, and in the 1370s, over, over paper, attempted papal taxation, uh, there's lots of anti-papal rhetoric, uh, and there's uh, complaints by the Pope uh, that uh, senior ecclesiastics are not allowing papal bulls asking for taxation to enter the kingdom. Uh, there's also uh, the, the statutes of provisors and prime in uh, which, well, they've inspired an enormous literature, so I won't attempt to go into them in, in great depth, uh, but, but to put it crudely there, they limit arguably more in paper than in practice, but that's subject to debate, uh, the role of the Pope in appointing to benefices uh, and uh, into sort of appeals uh, to, the, to the cure and so on. Uh, so yes, uh, that to cut a long story short, there's plenty of incidents where there, where tension can be identified uh, between uh, papal authority and uh, the experiences of both the church and the political community in England. Uh, however, while these uh, tensions surface again and again, uh, the the normal state of affairs was not one of crisis and conflict. Uh, for the most part, uh, people were able to, to balance and uh, fudge these responsibilities. Uh, and um, whether the, that strictly uh, adds up uh, to, a, to a logically pure way of balancing them, I think is open to question, but certainly on a day-to-day -day basis and in practice, uh, the role of the Pope, who after all was far away compared to the King, uh, can be uh, safely balanced alongside the authority. Thank you. Um, can I invoke a uh, director's privilege to ask two questions um, and to bring in um, our contributors on, on Zoom? So first of all, to Elizabeth, I've, I found the whole uh, sort of historical detective story there absolutely fascinating in terms of using those English records to recover um, some of the stories that were destroyed um, by the, uh, the Four Courts fire of 1922 during the Irish um, uh, Civil War. Um, looking at those exchequer payments, Elizabeth, um, there were some interesting variations in the names, and I know that you were saying that ethnicity is very difficult to kind of pin down um, there, but it looked to me like amongst your, your people, amongst your recidivists, amongst the people who weren't paying what they should have been paying to the English crown, um, there were obviously um, Gaelic Irish names, 
but there were also, it looked to me, some sort of Anglo-Norman names. Um, and I wondered if that's the old English community. I wondered if that's the sort of beginning of that process of Gaelicization of those old English nobles sort of uh, going AWOL and sort of, um, you know, casting off their allegiance to the English crown to some extent. Um, so that was, that's a question for you. Um, and then the question for John um, is about the, the social cachet of being a sheriff in Tudor England. Um, in the sense that obviously this is a position that's still worth lobbying for. Um, sheriffs are going to have an awful lot of work to do and probably be out of pocket. So why are they doing it? I mean, there must be some, um, it must improve their, um, their kind of social um, positioning within county society. So those are the two questions. John, shall I go first? Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, we're good. yeah. I um in answer to the question, yes, absolutely. But I think what's interesting about the edges of English Ireland here is that you see people with English names question mark pushing themselves away from English control. So it's not as straightforward as, you know, the settlers are definitely for royal power. Yes, we are start. I think Thomas de Clare, who is one of those names, absolutely does end up um, very strongly associated with the local um, Irish communities. So yes, what I think we're seeing at the edges is we're seeing people accommodating themselves to whatever they see as the prevailing political power in the area. So if Thomas de Clare can get away with not paying rent to the English exchequer, he's absolutely going to do so, um, just as the, um, you know, the O'Brien Lord will, if he can't, for the same area. So yes, um, and that process obviously massively picks up force in the later 14th and 15th centuries as English control in Ireland wanes dramatically. Uh, thank, thank you, John. Uh, it's, it's, it's really nice to see you again, and uh, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the the Shrievalty did in, did uh, did of course uh, increase the uh, this the social clout of sheriffs. Um, something interesting I thought was under the sumptuary laws, a sheriff was allowed to wear a slightly longer rank than than other other members of the gentry. So for 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 one year, he gets uh, he gets a slightly better robe uh, for for the time he's for the time he's doing that office. Um, is it the, whether whether or not people wanted to do it? I, I think that's a mixed bag. Like, um, men, you, you find many records of people seeking the office, but you also find many, if not more, records of people seeking not to do the office. So, um, so I think it depends. It, it all depends on the individual case. Um, something that historians have assumed in the past is that if somebody if somebody wanted to be a sheriff, there must have been some like um, there must have been some uh, malign reason for it. Some but somebody was probably trying to. Because we, as, as I talked about, sheriffs and panelled juries. So, so was a was a gentleman seeking to become sheriff, trying to exercise, trying to exercise his influence for a friend and uh, exercise undue influence over over a jury or something like that. Um, one of the things, although in the book, although I, I don't want to be naive and say that say that never happened, but I also want to be realistic. So I, I sort of come, I sort of like come come down in the middle somewhere. So obviously, uh, corruption did happen, but it wasn't a systemic uh, feature of the. Of the shrievel system, so uh, so yeah, I think that's that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. So we have two from online. Um, the first one is for John. How did the role of the sheriff differ in the Tudor period from that in the earlier medieval period, and how did it change within the Tudor period? Yeah, so that's that's another great question. Um, it's funny. I, yeah, I, uh, I I have a couple of pages in the in the introduction explaining why I chose the uh, the Tudor period because actually, well, the question is earlier medieval period. But if you're talking about the later medieval period, there are many consistencies um, in in in, the, in in what sheriffs had to do and so on. Um, but there were differences. So so I talk. I talk about several reforms in the in the book. Um, some of them some of them were techni technical. So the county court, for example, <clears throat> the county court started offering jury trials, uh, widespread jury trials in the Tudor period. So that was like a modernization of court procedure. Previously, previously, all trials at the county court had been wager of law. So uh, 
so a compurgation. So you could you could prove that you didn't owe something just by getting your mates to come into court and say no, he doesn't he doesn't owe, owe anything. So so there were technical reforms like that. Um, there was there was also there were also widespread reforms of the Shrivo revenue collection. So as I mentioned, the oh, I, I think I mentioned the the, the Shrivo tea was very expensive. Or I think no, actually it was John that mentioned. I wasn't. So the Shrivo tea was very expensive. You had to you had to pay all these traditional revenues, but sometimes it was difficult to levy those from the from the county. So sometimes the sheriff had to make that up from his own pocket. Uh, so there were so Parliament Parliament um, starting in starting in fifteen forty three. Um, introduced reforms to the uh, to this to the system of revenue collection and audit to make it easier to claim discounts for for revenue which which wasn't collected. Um, so yeah, uh, some, something I something I say in the book is that it was Tudor, Tudor governments didn't Tudor governments um, kind of solved problems as they came along. Uh, although they, they they sometimes did have overarching policies, they a lot a lot of policy is kind of uh, just fixing fixing leaks as they happen. So. So there were just lots of small small reforms to the uh, to the to the office of sheriff, um, but but in aggregate, all of those small reforms together did did uh, did involve uh, did involve important changes to the office. Thank you. The second question is for Elizabeth. Um, you touched on the difference between receipts from different countries. And I know the research is not complete, but can you comment on differences over the time period? Also, is there evidence of loans in the Crown in the records or only rent, tax and penalty receipts? I'll take the second question first. Um, yes, there are loans. And interestingly, you have to get payments for loans that were raised in that were involved with England. So the merchants of Lucca and the particularly the Ricciardi, who are major wine merchants whose network stretches across the Mediterranean, they're constantly paying in money in Dublin for a loan that had been taken from them by the king in England. So we get move across um, cross Irish Sea payments of loans. That's the main, you don't see the same kind of loans from the political community in the Exchequer records that you might, if you were looking at the English records for the same period. And in terms of the question about differences between counties, this is where it gets interesting because it's, because the patterns are really, really fuzzy. But what I would say is that you see much more from Dublin and the surrounding areas, so Kildare, Carlow, up into Meath. You see very little from Roscommon at all. That's an area which that is under heavy military intervention, and you just don't see very much from there at all. Um, you see a lot that seems to be tied to the mercantile centres, so a lot from Wexford and Waterford, the cities. Uh, you see Cork City a lot. You see... And then you see a lot from Jarkida, just to the north of Dublin. So what I'd say we see in terms of differences is areas that will become the holdout areas of English power in the later 14th and into the 15th centuries, you see a lot from in this period. You see a lot from the mercantile centres, and particularly the cities. Um, and... Someone has made this, Bruce Campbell has made the suggestion recently that what we're seeing in Ireland in this period economically is that Dublin's been drawn into the mercantile networks in England and that the other cities in Ireland are not being, towns and cities aren't being drawn to Dublin. I'm not sure that's what we're seeing in receipt rolls, but it's an interesting way of trying to conceptualise what's going on economically. Um, so in turn, so to sort of try and bring that into a pithy answer, what I think we're seeing is counties with a very strong established settler government and that strong local control. So the people like the sheriffs that John's been talking about in their Irish, in their English context, in their Irish context, you've got a strong local sheriff and you've got a strongly um, mercantile economic base, you will get, you see more receipts going to Dublin. So that would be the area around Dublin and then the cities on the south coast. Thank you.
Hi, yeah, thank you for three really, really amazing papers. Um, I've got a question for John. Um, how much do we know about the sort of investiture ceremonies of sheriffs? And was there any change sort of with the Reformation? John, you're muted. Sorry, uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so th there was an important ceremony in London, uh, as you might be aware. So, so sheriffs after just after just after sort of uh, swearing that oath, they, the sheriffs would ride ride to the exchequer and uh, and open to open their account. And it was kind of like it was it was considered to be a really important civic ceremony because um, even during plague years, um, it, the ceremony continued. Uh, it's something one of the reviewers for the book asked. They wanted me to say why did they why did they want to keep this ceremony even during the, the like the plague the plague years of the 1560s? And that, my my only answer is I have no idea. I, I don't know why <laughs> I don't know why this ceremony was so important. Um, uh, I, I, it might have been a, it might have been a legal thing because the ceremony the, for the London sheriffs the ceremony was um, was planned by the by the uh, by the alderman rather than by rather than by the privy council. But, uh, but yeah, is that is that what you were thinking of? And is that what you mean? Um, yeah, sort of, but but also, well, I suppose it's <laughs> we're sort of constrained by evidence. Um, but in in sort of the localities um, where the sheriffs were given a sort of local investiture ceremony, or, or whether there was any kind of um, local ceremony of any kind, or possibly uh, in, for 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 me, I, I, the main the main evidence I've seen is from municipal sheriffs. So in the in York, I believe there was a big feast, so the sheriff had to. When the sheriff became sheriff, he had to throw a feast for um, for the other the other like uh, worthies of the city. Um, in the counties, I in the counties, the closest thing I think is the is the first county court of a of a sheriff's term in office. So at the first county court, you would kind of announce your you had to announce your under sheriff in the in the in the common view of the county and uh, and uh, and uh, that, oh, that's when you were, that's when you were given the writ of like a writ of assistance as well, um, which was. Just a, like a technical procedure, but um, I don't think it was a. I don't think it was a big ceremony. I, I think it wouldn't have been as exciting as the sheriffs riding in London, or it wouldn't have been as uh, it wouldn't have been as fun as the the feasting in uh, in York, for example. So I, that's the that's all I know about that. Were Irish bishops as politically involved in English affairs as the English? I think this question's for Elizabeth. Um, what's really interesting about Irish bishops actually is how not involved they are. So in contrast to the things that Sam's been talking about in terms of um, you know, very strong political involvement by English bishops, Irish bishops, you get a very marked divide between bishops based in areas that are largely Gaelic, Irish, and bishops that are um, the bishops of Dublin, for example. So you see Irish bishops in settler areas a bit, but not as much. So um, the bishops of Ossory and of Dublin turn up as treasurers of the Exchequer, for example, um, or as justiciars, or, you know, kind of major administrative and thus political roles, but you also get a very strong contingent of bishops who are absolutely in no way engaged with the English system. And one of the things that struck me most as someone who did a lot of work on the English exchequer's relationship with the church for my doctorate and then the book that followed is that we're not seeing um, bishops' clerks turning up in the exchequer the way I would expect to see them in England. So it's a very different pattern of engagement and it possibly because of the divide between settler and Irish communities, the bishops stay much more out of uh, political affairs for whatever reason. I hope that answers your question. I'm afraid I offhand, apart from non-resident bishops, non-resident Irish bishops, I can't think of any that again involve specifically in English affairs, so I'm assuming your question's about Irish bishops in Ireland. The, the one uh, who isn't resident uh, sort of 
Irish bishops who gets involved in English politics really in the 14th century is Alexander Bickner, uh, who gets involved in sort of the negotiations between in uh, Edward II's reign between the, the Lancastrians uh, and, and the Crown. But that's Elizabeth will probably know more than me, but that's basically it in a substantive sense. There are some English bishops who go over to Ireland, like um, Thomas Charlton, Bishop of Hereford. But again, that's, uh, that, that's Elizabeth's yeah. domain rather than mine. Yeah. yeah, and Bickner is a really interesting example because he's essentially trying to play the Lancastrian dynastic game and falls on his face um, and that sets off all sorts of administrative and political repercussions. But yes, he's everybody else maybe seems to take his lesson and stays far away, I think.